Erev Tov Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benoon, and you are watching the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. And tonight, guys, this is our first broadcast starting back on doing teachings on Saturday, Yom Shabbat, as it is known in the Hebraic calendar. And for many of you that have been writing us and asking us to uh, come back and start teaching again, uh, this message tonight, I'm sure, will be a great blessing, especially for the sisters. Uh, it's something I wanted to recap on one more time. I've done, I haven't done it in quite a while, but it is speaking on equality, biblical equality. And this is something that a lot of people, uh, especially men, have been taught totally opposite of and have really no idea just how serious the issue is with God. And so I wanted to take and bring this up, especially in light since the last time I actually spoke on this subject, there were probably only about 20,000 subscribers. Now we're around 54, 55,000 subscribers, if I under, remember right. And uh, it's a lot bigger audience. And there's a lot of women that may not realize that some of the mistransl or mis yes, mistranslations of the King James Version Bible, if it was translated properly, would set you much freer than what you realize you should be. So let's get started here. Equality, man is not greater than woman is the title here that I put on this part. I may change it different when we hit it on YouTube here, but I wanna go right into this. I'm actually gonna take you to an Apocrypha book. Uh, to start with, we're gonna stick with the Bible pretty much throughout this, but this is actually what caused me to think about um, bringing this subject up was from the book of Thomas. Uh, and let me quote to you what he says here. Yeshua saw infants being suckled. He said to his disciples, these infants being suckled are like those who enter the kingdom. They said to him, shall we then as children enter the kingdom? Yeshua said to them, when you make the two one, and when you make the inside like the outside, and the outside like the inside, and the above like the below, and when you make the male and the female one and the same, so that male not be male, nor the female female. Now he goes on a little bit more in that, but I just thought that that was interesting. He was showing equality right there, showing that not one is greater than the other, even like he did with the apostles. Now to give you a little bit of background on the book of Thomas, it says here, uh, this is the introduction of the book of Thomas, there is a general consensus among scholars that the Gospel of Thomas, discovered over half a century ago in the Egyptian desert, dates to the very beginning of the Christian era and may well have taken first form before any of our four traditional canonical Gospels. During the first few decades after its discovery, several voices representing established Orthodox bias argued that the Gospel of Thomas uh, was a late second or third century agnostic forgery. Scholars currently involved in Thomas studies now largely reject that view. Though such arguments will still be heard from Orthodox apologists are encountered in some of their earlier publications about Thomas. So I believe personally that it is a very uh, authentic book myself. Now, Let's look again at what he says right there in the latter part of that verse. And when you make the male and the female one and the same, that's what's very interesting right there. You make them one and the same. In other words, there's no difference. So that the male not be male, nor the female female. Don't look at them as a gender. Because too many times they belittle women in doing so. And pastors have definitely, totally obliterated women especially in modern times. It's no different than in many times past. But Yeshua, in fact, you can go back many times what we read in some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, Clementine writings that Clement wrote, uh, quoting from Peter, we find out that Yeshua was very much open to women. He, in fact, he probably started the f first, what we would think of today as uh, uh, women's liberty there. Now, understand, I'm not in the, reversing the roles, I believe in equality, not one over the other. Because in the doctrine of Diana that uh, Paul and uh, Timothy faced, uh, this was the opposite way around. They believed that women were the ones that were created first. And, and of course, it doesn't matter who's created first. The point is they, they, they take and they make a hierarchy out of it. The doctrine of Diana did that in their 
particular uh, beliefs and religion of Paul's day, just as men have made it in their day today, they think because Adam was created first, he, for some reason he's greater than Eve. You're going to find out tonight it's just the opposite of that, or not the opposite, but it's equality and completely different on both sides. Anyway, let me show you, share with you another thing here. And I think it's very important that we understand some of the problems in translations to begin with. If you go to the book of Isaiah, for example, and this is one that many men have quoted. In fact, I was guilty at one time myself before doing very deep studies and research. Even my wife was the one that brought this scripture to my attention one day in light of what the Septuagint actually translates it as. In the King James Version, it says about Isaiah 3.12, as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee, cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy paths. And that's what King James Version translates this verse as. But what's going to really surprise you is the Septuagint, which was when the 70 uh, uh, Orthodox rabbis were translating the Hebrew Scriptures from uh, Hebrew to Greek, for the modern language of that day. And this is the way they did it in the Septuagint. Same verse says, O my people, your exactors strip you, and extortioners rule over you. O my people, they that pronounce you blesses lead you astray, and pervert the path of your feet. It's not speaking about women or children. It's literally condemning the ministers of their day. The rabbis in this case here. The rabbis have been exactors and they were also extortioners and rule over you. They had taken and gone away from the commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Horeb and instead have been teaching the doctrines, commandments of men as Yeshua points out in the Gospels. He said you teach for tra traditions of men the precepts of God. It's exactly what they do. But isn't that fascinating? Look at the difference. Over here in Isaiah 3.12, Keith KJV, For my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. According to the Septuagint, O my people, your exactors strip you, and extortioners rule over you. O my people, they that pronounce you blesses lead you astray. Who was the one that was, was doing the blessings over the people? It was the rabbis. And they're the ones that were leading them astray and pervert the path of your feet. What path? The narrow path, the narrow way. It wasn't women or children. It was the ministers, much like they're doing today. My gosh. Let's go back how it was in the beginning. I kind of threw up a picture of me and my wife when we first met. And uh, it was our beginning anyway. So I want to take you, though, and let's go back to the beginning a little bit and see exactly how God started this all off to start with. All right, we have here in Genesis 1-1, and I'm going to be using KJV because we need to see some of the, the, the little mishaps that happen in here. We're pretty good okay here in the beginning here, though. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Uh, it actually doesn't say heaven in Hebrew, it says heavens, but we'll go into that in a moment. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, in Hebrew, Barashit baralahim et hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz. Now, keep in mind the word bara. Literally, the word barashit means at the first. Bara is created. Bara Elohim. In other words, God created. Hold that word bara in your mind. But I really want you to pay attention to the next verse, because this is really prophetic. It's a sign that God was giving to you to know when Yeshua came, at least for the Jews back 2,000 years ago. Watch what he says. This is where it's at. And the Spirit of God walked upon the waters. Do you not realize that God was showing that the Jewish people, when Yeshua walked on the water and came to his disciples in the ship, it was God giving his own disciples a sign that he was the very God that brewed over the face of the waters in the book of Genesis. He was letting them know that he was that God. 
Just like when he took, for example, the blind man and he took and he, and he, and he spit on the ground and he took and he made some clay and anointed his eyes and tells him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Do you think that when he told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam that it was some magical thing about the water in the pool of Siloam? No. What was Yeshua doing? He was showing that he was the same God that formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. So what did he do? He took and he spit on the ground and he made some mud like clay, put it on his eyes to demonstrate that he was the same God that created Adam from the dust of the earth in the book of Genesis. And he went and washed his eyes. He received his sight. You see, Yeshua was constantly giving signs to let the children of Israel know that the anointed one in their presence, the Mashiach, was none other than God on the earth. So fascinating, to say the least. Anyway, God said, let there be light. And it was light. So, okay, so I told you, you, you want to remember the bra. All right? And this is where we're going to get into it right here in Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image God, uh, of God created he him. Male and female created he them. See, the ibara. That's where Be'ibara Elohim, the bara right there is the word created, just like you had in the beginning there. Barashit bara Elohim. Okay? In this case here, God is creating the man. And he God creates them. Alright? Male and female, he creates them. Now, I really believe that this is when they're, they're being created in, like, the spirit realm. Okay? It's like the spirit part of their being. Maybe the soul of them is being created. Now, it's really kind of hard to kind of figure out how things go, when goes where, and stuff like that. So I won't go much into that at this point here. But I will say this. When the fall comes, we find also that Adam does talk about the skins. Because we know that God says that he says to Adam, when they partake of the fruit of the tree. See, there, there's two trees in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life, Eitz Chaim, which every scholar would, would, would beg to say that this is... Yeshua, that he was that tree of life. And then there's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, if you partake of Yeshua, that's life. That's taking of him. That's taking him into you. All right? Or you can partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They had that option. Okay? Now, the thing is, when they do sin, and the fall does come, they're pushed out of the garden, and God clothed them in skins. Now, some people argue, well, God killed a lamb and that's how he got it. I don't agree with that. I do believe that the Barah shows that there was a creation, okay, that is a spirit form. This is because remember, they were in a, in, 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 a, in a glorified state. All right? Now, like I said, we, we, I can't really go into that too deep right now. It's a deep subject, very difficult to explain and, and to go into it. But if you look at the book of Adam and Eve, for example, you will see that, that even Adam, he's confused by uh, what he has now, and he's talking about his own skins. He's confused by it, and he's asking God, what is this? He said, I was clothed in your glory. So even though God forms the man from the dust to the ground, and this is before the fall, we know that as well, there's still something different. When he was formed from the dust to the ground, there's still something different that changes after the fall. And that's what's kind of a little bit confusing, but it does change. Now, let's go on to Genesis 2-7 because there is a difference, like I said, between creating and the fact that he forms them. All right? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. All right, now you see that in English, but it's a little different in Hebrew, and you got to watch what he says here. The Itzar Adonai Elohim. All right, now I don't pronounce it the Yod Vav Hey because, as the Jewish people, you know, we, we realize that we don't really know for sure. And there's a lot of argument. Uh, Nehemiah Gordon, he believes that, you know, that he knows how the, what the name really is. 
Uh, I, me and Nehemiah, we've, we've emailed back and forth before. I disagree with that because the book of Zephaniah says that we will not know the pronunciation of that name until Israel is surrounded by armies. That's in the book of Zephaniah. Now, we have to take it up with God because God told his prophet Zephaniah that that divine name would not be given, but he said, I'll give a pure language to the people where you can all call upon this divine name. And by the way, even in the Qumran scrolls there, we find that they use the ancient Hebrew uh, letters for the divine name. So there's something different between the Tetragrammaton and those particular letters that are used there. But anyway, Ve'itzar, Ve'itzar, excuse me, Adonai Elohim, see, and God formed, that first word, Ve'itzar, Itzar is the word for formed. He's not being created here, now he's being formed. He's given a physical body. All right, but there's still something seems to be different because he puts skin on him afterwards. And you, can't, you cannot say that God went and killed an animal and put skins on him like that. Now, Adam does, uh, the, the, the book of Adam and Eve also speaks about when they sewed fig leaves together, but, you know, because they realized that they're naked, and then God says that there was a, uh, the book of Adam and Eve said there was a dead uh, lamb there, and he took the skins from that, and he clothed them. But the first part of the skin is not talking about the skin of an animal. And therefore, we can't, like I said, we cannot ascribe God as a murderer. Because the Bible clearly says that, that Satan is the, is the father of all lies and was a murderer from the beginning. So there's a big difference right there. All right, so anyway. Adonai Elohim et ha'adam afar min See, so he formed him from the dust of the ground. Ipak be'pa'av. See, and he, and he breathes in his nose. Nishmar ha'im. The breath of life. Now, this is, this is incredible right here. Nishmar Chayim. The Chayim is God's own life, a portion of God's own life, being breathed into Adam, but it's in the plural. Why is it in the plural? Because at this point here, Eve is inside of him. They're one unit. They're created as one unit. The two are one. You understand? So, even after Eve is is, is, is uh, taken from Adam's side, you never see anywhere where God has to breathe into her nostrils a breath of life. Why? She comes out there with the Holy Spirit. It's the same reason, by the way, this is why John the Baptist was born on the earth, filled with his, the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. It was a type of Eve coming forth. See why? Because he was typing a bride for Yeshua. And Adam's bride came forth filled with the Holy Spirit, so must John come forth, forth filled with the Holy Spirit, right? So I think it's incredible some of the types that are in here. Uh, so anyway, so he says he breathed into him the breath of life in that plural form. But then he says something very odd right after that. Ve'yehi adam, and the man became le'nefesh chaya, he became a living soul. Now that shows the singularity, singular, uh, singularity, in other words, he is by himself, but Eve is within him. So the Chaya, that again is the life of God in him, the yod -Heh, there's God right there. His own life is inside of Adam. He's a living soul. La Nefesh, see, for the soul, Chaya is literally what it says. For the soul was God's life inside of him. Just a beautiful thing here. The reason why I'm going into this, friends, for you so you understand, especially for the sisters that are listening as well, uh, and the brothers, so that you understand as well, is that it's important that you see these things because it's the only way you'll ever understand that God created us the same. So, and I don't have time in this broadcast tonight to go into all the issues, but we're going we're gonna to try to touch on enough to at least give you an idea that God does not have men ruling over women. It's never God's intention. It's nowhere in the scriptures. We can find this even historically. Uh, every place that you find it in the scripture it's only because of mistranslations in most cases here. All right, so let's take a literal look at what we see here. And as I already, I've already, really already explained this here, Ipak Ba'av Nishmat Chaim, and he breathed in his nose the breath of Yah's life is what he did. All right, now, moving right along. Now, if you'll notice, Genesis 2, 7, we went over this already as well. Adam is, is singular now. Ve'yahi ha'adam le'nefesh chaya. Right? All right. Now, moving right along then. Here's what is also fascinating as well. Going back to the created part, where God bara, see, he bara, he created them, and he made them male and female, right? Now, I want you to notice something as well, because when God created them, 
there's actually a little bit of a difference in what they're called. All right, Adam is called Ad Adam because he comes from the ground, Adama. The ground is Adama. Okay, Eve or Chava is actually her name uh, that, we, that she's given. That name comes from the word of mother of life. Uh, a little different than the word life that God has, but she, in other words, she brings forth children. All right, but what's fascinating though is that he actually calls them Ish and Isha. And this is where the created part comes in because the Ish and Isha, I can prove to you that this is actually speaking of their souls. Let's look at this. Genesis 2.24, Therefore shall a man, in this case here, he calls him Ish. He doesn't call him Adam. See? Akin Yatsav Ish. All right? Therefore shall a man, Ish, leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now, a lot of people have got really... Probably the way that I've always thought of it as well, that, you know, as, as we grow up, we leave our father and mother and we go and we get married. I actually believe that this applied to Adam personally. And why I say that, now, I don't say it like Mary being a mother of God like the Catholic Church. I don't mean it like that whatsoever. But see, God himself is both father and mother. You know, he, in, within him, he is all of that. He is, he is our father, our mother, our, you know, everything. He is our father and mother. Truly. And we see this. This is plainly in the scripture. I wish I would have pulled up some scriptures on this just to show you that. But that's actually written in the Bible. We know that he's both father and mother. All right. So I believe that when God is speaking about, therefore shall a man each leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. This is literally speaking about the creation process that God had done. So, in other words, he took the Ish and he put it in that form, that body, and he put Eve inside of there with him. So he left father and mother. In other words, the spirit that God had created, the soul of Adam, left God and came and cleaved with his wife, and they too were become, they were one in body. All right, now watch this so you can kind of see. I'll, I'll help you see this as we break it down. Genesis 2.22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman and brought her unto the man. There's a lot of debate. Two sides on that as far as rib. One side of the rabbinical debate is it wasn't a physical rib. Okay? Uh, it's from the side. Literally, in some rabbis, they actually believe that God took the whole side of the man and then turned around and formed a woman from that. Uh, and many rabbis do believe that God took greater care in forming her than he did Adam. Eh, that's debatable. I, I, I won't say one way or the other. But anyway, let's, let's look at this. And the Ben Adonai Elohim et Hatzala Ashar Lakach Min Adam. See? La Isha. Excuse me. Ve'ive El Adam. All right? So he takes from Adam, from this man, he's taken, he takes La Isha. Now, La Isha is the woman, or Isha. You can drop the Lamed in this case here because it becomes Isha. So she's called Isha, he is called Ish. All right, remember the, the verse we just used before, right there in Isaiah 2.24, he's called Ish, she's called Isha, the feminine and masculine forms of that spirit. Now I say spirit, you'll see why now. Here's where we get it from. Both of their names contain the word Ish, which is fire, all right? Now, I don't know how that works on your screen here. I'm looking at my screen. On the right side, the Aleph Yod Shin is Ish. This is how you spell man in the Hebraic language. Isha, on the left side of the screen there, Aleph Shin He is how you spell for the woman. Even the rabbinical uh, teachers have recognized that, yes, that this is God's divine name. In the middle of the Ish is Yod, which is the first letter for God's divine name. And Isha, the last letter in her name, the He, put them together, you have Yah which is God, uh, his divine name there. And, what, and if you take, as the rabbis say, if you take uh, Yah out of, the, out of the marriage equation, you have nothing but a consuming fire and they completely die. But really, what is it? The fire, the Aleph Sheen, the word Aish, which you see at the top of your screen here, Aleph Sheen, this represents the spirit of Almighty God. So when he created them, Ish and Isha, what was it? He was literally creating the fire of God, the spirit of God, their, their, the very essence of their being 
coming from God himself. And then he breathes into their bodies, nishmat chayim, God's own life being put inside of a human body as well. Very fascinating the way that God has worded this in his word here. Anyway, let's move right on. I want to move to the fall because now we're going to get into the debate about does did God ordain man to rule over women? And I don't agree with that at all. Now, uh, everybody knows the story. So as for time's sake, I decided to only put one verse in here, and this is when God is speaking to the woman. But we know that, um, that Eve goes, she's deceived by the serpent, Nechash, uh, and she partakes of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which God has commanded not to eat. Now, there is a lot of debate. Some rabbis try to say, you know, well, the first thing that Eve did wrong was she said that God has said to them not to eat of the tree, and she added to the word because not, God never spoke to her. Uh, I disagree with that. And the reason why I disagree with that is because if that would have been a commandment that she had broken, God would have addressed that when he addressed the sins that were being committed. God never does address with her that, you know, why did you say that God has said when I never spoke to you? So it's kind of, it's kind of uh, adding something into the text that's not really there. So rabbinical uh, uh, scholars are speaking these things, it's not correct. Neither is this correct for not just rabbinic rabbis. Also, there's, there's many uh, pastors that try to say the same, that she said that God said and God never said nothing to her. We don't get to see everything. Not everything is written down. As it says about Yeshua, had all the books been written about him, the world could not contain them, the things that he did while he was here. So clearly not everything is going to be written down. She said to the serpent, the Lord has said, thus, 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 all right? So her testimony stands true because God never corrects her for that, all right? That's one point. Anyway, though, her husband comes, she gets to him, and he, see, now she was beguiled. She tells even God, the serpent beguiled me. But when it comes to the man, he knows that he shouldn't do it, but he does it anyway. Now, some argue that he's a, he's a hero and he does it in order to save her life. But if that were the case, then why does he cower down when God comes to, to ask, what has he done? And he blames it on the woman. He said, the woman that you gave me, she did it. All right. Now, we know that God says, too, I will put enmity between the woman and between thy seed and her seed. He speaks to, 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 to Satan. He says, I'll, he says, what have you done? He curses the serpent. So the serpent couldn't have been like, like uh, we are today. In fact, one of the very gods that is used in uh, ancient, uh, the ancient world, the Babylonians, etc., the Egyptians, they used the serpent god, uh, Marduk, which is like a dog with a snake-like head. And maybe this is exactly what the serpent looked like. Can't really say for sure, but nonetheless, they're communicating together. And as this comes about and God says to him, I'll put enmity or hatred between uh, the woman, between you and the woman, and between her seed and your seed. So yes, a woman does have a seed, contrary to rabbinical thinking, because the Bible does say that she had, would have a seed. All right. Now, the other thing is that we have to look at this, is that God was going to put, um, he puts basically the woman on his side. You have to think about that, because the Satan is against her, and that's God's enemy as well. So if he's against the woman, he's also against uh uh, Eve as well. And it's also prophetically speaking as well because it is speaking about the coming of the Messiah, Yeshua, who would come through a woman that would believe the word of God. We'll go into that in a little bit as well. Anyway, Genesis 3, 16. This is where we get into a very interesting point here. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. How many people have believed all their life that this is the perfect way it is and that man has been given a divine authority to rule over his wife because why? They say that she sinned and, and that uh, he should be the ruler because uh, she messed everything up. Well, this, there's scripture also that puts the blame on him squarely. And of course, there's scripture that put the blame on her. But nonetheless, they're both guilty in what they did. The difference is he willingly sinned, and she did it being deceived, not doing anything intentionally. You know, did she lust for whatever it was, the knowledge or whatever? Well, clearly this is also true, but that's not the point. The point is she was deceived in what she did. Satan lured her into this, and she fell into that trap. So she didn't do anything intentionally is the whole point. But here, let's look at how the scripture should be translated. And let's take a look at it in the Hebraic language. All right. And we have here, because I was reading to you King James Version. So it says here, El Haisha Amar Harabah 
This is what's really important right here. And we're going to look at this in the book of Proverbs in just a moment, in verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 12, the word arabe. Because the word arabe means lying in wait, or the one lying in wait. So actually, the scripture should be saying, unto the woman he said, the one lieth in wait shall cause you great sorrow. And literally, the word nachash, that serpent, that word, is like one that ambushes. That's what, the, that's what the ancient Paleo-Hebrew makes a note of the serpent, Nechash. It is one that, 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 that leaps out to attack you. And so it perfectly lines up when we look at this. Now, they translate this what they believed it to be. But oddly enough, in the Proverbs, they take uh, Rabbe, the one that's bolded for you here, and they translate it totally different. That's the second line down, by the way, for those that don't know Hebrew, that bolded part right there. That literally means lying in wait. So he said, so God is, or so he says unto the woman, he says, the one that, that was lying in wait shall cause you great sorrow. And conception in sorrow, thou shalt birth sons. It doesn't even say children. It says, taladim benim. You'll birth sons. See, God is prophesying to Eve. He's prophesying to her what's going to happen. All right? And then he goes on to say, and Watch this. Ve'el ishach teshatucha ve'hu imashal bach. See, and you shall turn to your husband. See, tashuk techa. You will turn to him. It doesn't say anything about, and he shall rule over you. Or, or you know, or, or as, let me go back to the King James Version right here where it says here, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. It doesn't say that. You know, if I remember right, even the Septuagint, I believe, translates this right here. To shutecha. And you shall turn to your husband. And he shall rule over you. See, God is showing what's going to happen. In other words, they lose their, their dominion with God. Not dom their, the dominions over the whole earth, the dominions over the animals, etc., that God has given them. But they lose that, uh, I should say, relationship with God. The direct relationship that they had from the beginning. And they're thrown out of the Garden of Eden. And that dimension that they were in there, they were put onto this earth. And when they're thrown out of the Garden of Eden, then she is no longer, she, she's not in that direct contact with God. So now she's leaning on Him. And it's not just speaking of Adam and Eve. This is also speaking for all the descendants all the way down. Because of this, people have perverted the word so much now that what happens, women are looking to their husbands and they're turning to their husbands instead of turning to God. See, sister, you're supposed to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship between you and God. There is no middle man. Yeshua said, except that you are willing to leave father, mother, brother, sister, husband, and wife, you're not worthy of me. All right, so you have to be willing to give it all to him. Not turn to your husband so he can rule over you. I, I promise you, and, it's, and it can be either way when it comes to that. If a man just turns to his wife and everything, she may rule over him as well. But the reason why this happened is because he was bigger than her, and it's most of the cases today anyway. All right, but see, this is where, all the, this is where everything gets all construed. Now, I said to you, if you go to Proverbs, and even in the King James, it, it actually translates the word correct. Now is she without now in the streets and lieth and wait at every corner? See? Ba'am b'chutz. Ba'am b'chavot. V'atzal kol p'ne ha'arabe. Lying in wait. Ready to jump out. You know? I forget what it is in Proverbs. I guess it's speaking of, 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 a, of a, a, a sinful woman, a prostitute perhaps. I don't, I don't remember out of hand, but that's what it means. Our base. So why is it translated lying in wait here, but in Genesis they translate it to multiply your sorrow greatly? You know, the thing is the words are very nearly the same. And generally what it is, the vowels is what separates the difference. But you have to look at the context of what's going on, especially with Tushotecha. You will turn to your husband and he will rule over you. So it wasn't that you know, and, and also the word sorrow there is not, you know, why, why did God, pray that? literally the word sorrow, see the one that lies in wait causes her sorrow. What's the sorrow? She ends up having two boys. And one, God knew that one is going to kill the other. Cain is going to kill Abel. 
So the one that was lying in wait, the serpent that deceived her, is the one that causes her great sorrow. Why? Because her children would be born, and one would hate the other and be jealous and would kill his brother. That's why. Let's move on. So anyway, man sinned willfully. Woman sinned in ignorance. That's something I wanted you to think about as well. Because this is what's going on. Yeshua come to correct Adam's mistake. He, Yeshua, kept the word of God without failure and redeemed mankind. Okay, see, this is, see, you know, when, when Yeshua fell, excuse me, I'm sorry, forgive me. When Adam sinned and fell, it took a redeemer. Yeshua had to come and redeem him. The book of Adam and Eve even says that. He tells Adam, I will come and I will give my blood. He says in five and a half days, he wasn't talking about earthly days, I'll come and redeem you. A lot of things can be said on that. There's some deep things that I could share with you, but I can't, not everybody can handle everything. All right, but the question though begs though, before Yeshua could come, do you realize he had to find a woman to fix Eve's mistake? Because Eve did a mistake as well. Eve disbelieved God's word. She doubted God's word. And that's what caused her to sin. And God was looking for a woman. Of course, he knows who it's going to be. But he's looking for a woman that would believe his word. When he had Abraham and Sarah... Sarah said, how could this be? Me be an old woman, have pleasure with my Lord again. See, she doubted God's word. But Mary, what did she do? Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. It took all those years for God to find a woman that would actually make that statement and would believe. And when she believed, that's what brought forth that child. That's what caused Yeshua to come into the earth and to save mankind from their sins. All right, now let's turn to some New Testament examples as well as far as some of the misconstrued ideas out there about women uh, and that men should be ruling over women. All right, 1 Timothy, very interesting scripture here, and I, and I actually should have started with a different one uh, over in Ephesians, but we'll go into that in just a few minutes. Like I said, friends, there's a lot of them out there. Every one of them, though, you're going to find out, have been mistranslated. Why? It was done intentionally. Men have tried to keep women in subjection to their own whims. But it's not what God's a word says. So brethren, I pray that you understand. I, every time I bring this subject up, it really stirs up a lot of men. But you know, guys, truth is truth. You got to accept what the truth is and not what our own desire is. I used to think the same way. I used to think the exact same thing you did. I always thought that men were over the women, etc., okay? But it's not the way it is, all right? 1 Timothy 2.11, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to assert authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first born, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being in deceived was in transgression, notwithstanding she shall be saved if in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, the first thing I want to ask you, since when does... Having babies bring you salvation. Now, I thought all good believing Christians believe that salvation comes through Yeshua and Him alone. Jesus, in case those that don't know the name that I'm saying here, Yeshua is His actual name. All right. I thought that salvation come through Him. Since when does it come through having babies? What about a woman that can't give birth? Is she damned and going to hell because she can't have babies? Is she damned because she's infertile? No. So this is kind of absurd. So something's wrong. You Just by that, you can see something is wrong. Also, it's, notice, let the woman, singular, didn't say let women learn in silence with all subjection. So you should see another problem. All right, let's first look at something. You have to remember, in the day of Timothy and Paul, when Timothy would write a letter to Paul, Paul would answer back. We didn't get to see both sides of the argument. We only get to see one side. So we have to kind of look at the customs of what's going on as well to understand and then look at the way 
the Koine Greek actually brings out the words that have been mistranslated in modern days. Diana and Artemis, or Artemis, excuse me, the cult of Diana or Artemis was so powerful and widespread religiously and economically in the first century that it caused a very dangerous environment in some places for those who preached the gospel of God as the Apostle Paul found out during his third missionary journey. All right, now you can see this multi-breasted uh, goddess here that they had, a statue called Artemis. Uh, they called it Diana as well. Many statues were made. They made tons of money doing this. And as well, uh, they believed in wild sex orgies. In fact, this is one reason why you get the part about childbearing. Paul didn't say, uh, you know, if you continue in childbearing. He actually says, you know, you will be safe in childbearing. Because why? They believed in the doctrine of Diana that if, they, if the husbands didn't go to one of these wild sex orgies at these goddess temples here, that the woman would end up having trouble with her pregnancy and could have a deformed child or something like that or miscarriage. This is what they were being taught. All right? Now, so let's take a look at this. Acts 19.23, to give you an idea of what was going on at that time. In the same time, there arose no small stir about the way, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, uh, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Doesn't that thing make you think of the Catholic Church? They've got their wealth all kinds of different companies, but definitely the oil companies. And so therefore, there's a big problem in the Middle East for having Russia there. We've got to get this all together. Don't you know we make all our money by the oil that's in the Middle East to so get Russia out of there so that we can keep making our money Shell International? Sorry about that, Mr. Popey. Anyway, Acts 19.26, Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipped. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Friends, it got really, really nasty and ugly. So we must remember, getting a, a, a one-sided conversation, as I mentioned before, it's what makes it difficult to understand what's really going on. But let's take and learn, uh, let's look at the New Testament here. Again, well, you can see the scriptures here on the left about 1 Timothy from KJV, King James Version there. All right, look at verse uh, 11 of chapter 2. Let the woman, a singular, learn in silence. Now, he actually is saying literally, let that woman learn in silence. See, what is believed that has happened is that a woman came in to begin to disrupt the service and scream violently. And it's actually written in Koine Greek where we can see that. Because in verse 12, But I suffer not that woman to usurp, which is the word authenteo, which is to use violent behavior over a man. And it's literally one man, not men and not women. This was speaking of one woman that was coming in using absolute violent be, you know, actions against one man and he couldn't teach the gospel because this woman was coming in there going nuts over him. Remember, their doctrine believes that women were created first, men created second, and that the women were enlightened and men were a bunch of idiots. That's what they really believed. Like I said, they just reverse roles. And when I say reverse roles, not what the truth is, but what men have done to women, making women less. We're created first, and you're nothing but a nobody. It's no different. You get that idea there that because a man's created first, and a woman is just some uh, worthless byproduct or something like that, you're no different than the goddess of Diana. Same religion, just reversed around. All right? Now, in the Koine Greek, the woman was dominating this meaning, as we, as we see from the problem in Timothy, even had uh, the idol makers. Also, Paul addresses that Adam is formed first, Remember their doctrine. Okay, we, we already went over this. I'm sorry about that. See, but here's the other part here. Verse 15, notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing. It doesn't say that. It actually says she shall be safe in childbearing. That's the proper translation for that scripture right there. So the doctrine of Diana was taught that women were created first. I told you about that. And the women that were enlightened, not men. All right. Now, 
I want to take you real quick to Ephesians and we'll close. This will be our last page here. And then we'll just kind of touch on this quickly. This really, you can see this even in Genesis here. Uh, and like I said, there's many other scriptures that could be brought up. And I know that many people would bring them up. If you go on uh, Rise Women of God, my wife's uh, uh, YouTube channel, you can find more teachings on women as well as on our own channel here, Israeli News Live. Look down at the different categories we have. We have one, teachings on women, that we go into many other of these scriptures that you can also look into. Anyway, Ephesians 5.21, submitting, see, yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now that word is actually hupotosomai, all right? It's in the middle voice, it's mutual submission. If it was hupotosomai, without the, uh, the me on the end of it there, then it would be like slavery. And that's actually where, when it speaks about these slaves being subject to their masters, it does use that word, but not the M-E-E-E -E -E sound in there, the hupotosomai. -e. That changes it altogether into mutual submission. All right? Verse 22, wives, they put in there, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. The word submit's not in there. They just injected it. They figured, well, I guess... We need a woman to submit to us. It just says, wives, your, uh, wives uh, unto your husbands, or your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband, now watch this, the husband is the head. This is really funny here. See, English, especially Old English, and this is really where this comes into. This is not really so much a mistranslation, but you're dealing with a, a, a change of language over the many, many years, you know, over a hundred years ago, when you had the, uh, the old English language, the word head doesn't necessarily mean boss. But in modern English today, we think of head as being the boss of something. But the word kephale in Greek is the word for source. So it's not when it says for the husband is the head of the wife, he's the source of the wife. Remember what we showed you in the book of Genesis. See, God created Adam, but he actually created them both in the beginning. But when he formed Adam... He taken from, mean ish, literally from uh, the fire of Yahweh that was inside of him. He takes from that fire of God that's inside of Adam and he brings out Isha. Okay? This is how God does the creation. So Adam, the man or the husband, is the source of the woman in the creation sense, because this is what Paul's dealing with. And why is he dealing with this issue to begin with? Because of this doctrine that they have there that, you know, that it's the other way around. God created the woman and not the man first, all right? So of the wife, even as Christ is the head or the source of the church. See? In other words, from him, he breathed the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. That's what he means by he's the source of the church. Because why? On the day of Pentecost, he come and he breathed upon them. See, the Holy Spirit come upon him. And even before that, when he breathed upon his apostles after his resurrection, he says, receive you the Holy Spirit. And by the way, do you not know that that's another sign showing that he was the very God in Genesis? When he breathed, uh, nishma, uh, excuse me, ipak, uh, pa'av nishmar chayim. He breathed in Adam's nostrils and said, Receive you the Holy Ghost. He was showing you when he breathed on his own apostles that he was the same God that breathed upon Adam and Eve and breathed that life into Adam. He breathed on them and said, Receive you the Holy Spirit. And then what happened on the day of Pentecost? That was the birth of the church. It was that life from him came upon them like it was with Adam and Eve in the garden when God first created them. My gosh, friends. So anyway, it's source. It has nothing to do with boss. All right? Therefore, as the church is... Watch this. So Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Oh, my gosh. I don't have time to get into all that. Husbands, love or agape your wives. That's a godly kind of love. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Oh, friends. So much more. Um, let, me, let me just real quick here. Uh, hmm.
I, I, we'll just have to close, friends. I, I, I don't want, I run out of time, and I, I, I want to get this up to you. Uh, like I said, go, you can look at a lot of these messages, really fascinating things here, and I trust it's been a blessing. I know that we're going to get emails from sisters out there that did not know these things, and maybe because you are new to our channel here, but uh, you, you can write us. Uh, our, our email address is stephenbenoon at aol.com. Um, or you can go to our website, israelinewslive.org, israelreturns.com. And on our website there, you will see where you can email us. It'll come straight to me anyway. Uh, do keep in mind, because of the trip we were on, I'm still behind on emails. Uh, I had about 400 when I started trying to catch up on them here just the other day. And I've still got a couple of hundred to go. So please be patient. I know, friends, many of you have emailed me more than a week ago, and I apologize. Uh, I do this all by myself, so it takes, it takes some time. So if you leave messages on Facebook, the same thing there, it takes a long time. If I just did answering all the emails and the, and, the, and the messages I get, I would never, ever be able to do what I do now. Anyway, we love you guys. God bless you. Thank you for watching, and uh, we'll pick up the news tomorrow evening back again Sunday uh, with the new news broadcast, catching up on the things that are going on in the world. In fact, it's going to be an interesting broadcast tomorrow because we are on the verge of World War III. Shalom.